any Buddha or Bodhisattva who has an affinity with a sentient being in hell and goes there to teach him or her is called earth treasure Bodhisattva. We may have an affinity with a sentient being in the hell realms. When we become a Bodhisattva or a Buddha and the catalytic condition has matured we will be able to go there to help them and then we too will be called earth treasure bodhisattva. Therefore the name of a Buddha or bodhisattva is simply a generic name and does not indicate any one specific individual. In the earth treasure sutra we have seen that it is very difficult to help sentient beings who have already descended into the hell realms. Earth treasure bodhisattva has great wisdom, great supernatural abilities, great transcendent abilities. Thus he can help the sentient beings in hell even to reach the western pure land. However, due to our habitual behavior, when we are able to ascend to the heaven realms, we continue to commit wrongdoings. And after life in the heaven realms has ended, we will again fall into the hell realms. But to earth treasure bodhisattva, it is as if we have been gone only a few days. Once in the hell realms, we will experience continuous suffering, so we will be unable to cultivate. Thus our hatred and resultant negative karma will increase, will become more binding. The sutras clearly explain this for us. From this, we can begin to understand how difficult it is to help sentient beings once they have descended into the hell realms. At what point can we be helped? After we have committed wrongdoings, but before we pass on, and descend into the hell realms. During this time, we must be awakened so that through feelings of intense remorse and terrifying fear, we will diligently forego thinking, saying, doing anything that is bad and only do that which is good. In this way, we will maintain purity of mind. And in this way, we can change our present condition and transform a bad situation into a good one. It would be even better if we could bring forth the great Bodhi mind. If at the moment of death we sincerely regret as we recite Amitabha one to ten times and seek birth into the Pure Land, we will accomplish this birth even though we would have been born into the Avicii hell. We will be born there as non-regressive bodhisattvas. Once there, we will have the opportunity to return to our world, to help the sentient beings here whom we have an affinity with to also transcend the hell realm. Often, we may have done various good deeds 
but continued to be ridiculed and looked down upon by others. Or we may have suffered illness or poverty with one lifetime worse than the previous one. Why? Our serious misdeeds have been reduced to a relatively lighter retribution, which has manifested in the present lifetime. In other words, to be in this situation means that our heavy transgressions have become lighter. As the Diamond Sutra says, we may be poor, debase, or observe and deserve the path of hell due to our past transgressions. And because of this, we suffer poverty in this lifetime. However, when we accept and practice, we will eradicate our transgressions and eventually obtain perfect, complete enlightenment. Thus, we are able to transform bad karma with one single thought of enlightenment. Furthermore, the sutras tell us that when we are performing the deeds of a bodhisattva, the Buddhas, bodhisattvas, and heavenly beings will constantly support, will constantly help us. If we encounter obstacles and difficulties when doing good deeds, it is due to our negative karma simply being too great. If we can just grit our teeth and continue to diligently perform the deeds to accumulate merits and virtues, we will overcome our present suffering and bring forth innumerable benefits and good fortune. Act willingly to accord with diversity. Act willingly to accord with adversity. To dissolve our debts, we need to repay them with calmness, without any trace of hatred or grievance. If we feel hatred, then in our next lifetime, it will simply be much greater than it was in this lifetime. My teacher, Venerable Master Jing Kong, is a good example of this. He underwent many deprivations, but remained diligent and hardworking. Subsequently, after many years of this, he met Ms. Ing Han and her husband, who provided him with full support. Only then did he have a manageable standard of living and was able to continue with his lecturing and teaching. His obstacles and hardships were a result of negative karma created in past lifetimes. However, in patiently bearing these difficulties, his negative karma was gradually eliminated. The establishment of the Huatzon Library and the later establishment of the corporate body of the Educational Foundation were the turning points. Presently, under his guidance, over 50 Pure Land Learning Centers and Amitabha Buddhist Societies around the world helped to propagate the Buddha's teachings. This is the manifestation of good fortune, which is in accordance with the teachings in the sutras. Therefore, we must not be discouraged in the face 
of adversity. It has been said that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas arrange everything in our lives. All hardships and adverse conditions, no matter how severe, have been prearranged by them as well. The purpose of these is to gradually eliminate our negative karma until we accumulate merits and virtues. Also, they help cultivators advance their state of practice and to achieve attainment. Why would Buddhas and Bodhisattvas wish us ill? To them, true cultivators are very precious. Understanding this principle, we will patiently and diligently endure hardships without feeling discouraged. Once we have proven the truth of the Buddha's teachings for ourselves, we will then be able to understand that any failure, no matter how big or small, is the benevolent arrangement of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. However, those who do not understand this in the face of adversity begin to raise doubts in Buddhism. They will then blame the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas for not providing them with protection and guidance, further slandering the Triple Jewels. Consequently, they end up committing further transgressions. How would they not fall back under these circumstances? The Buddha told us that we would do well to thoroughly and deeply understand the teachings in the sutras so that we will not feel hopeless when crises occur. Regardless of good or bad circumstances, we ought to remain calm and composed. Bad times serve to eradicate our elim and eliminate our bad karma. Do good times present any benefits? If we do not possess deep concentration and wisdom during good times, we will regress. Why? Because our minds have given rise to greed. Although we intend to behave properly, for example, we intend not to lose our temper, something happens and before we can stop ourselves, we become angry. We give rise to thoughts of greed when we do not get what we want. So we give way to resentment. This all happens because we are still controlled by our negative karma. How do we overcome this? By listening more to lectures and putting the teachings into practice. Understanding and practice are equally important as they complement each other and lead to an even higher level of understanding and practice. Actually, attaining good fortune may not be good for us. When good fortune arises, and we do not enjoy it, but rather we share it with others and thus benefit all sentient beings, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will in turn bring us more good fortune. But when we do not possess a certain degree of concentration and wisdom, 
they will not immediately bring us more good fortune. Why? They know that it could only harm us. They will allow us to suffer a little more because, because hardship is beneficial for our practice. From this, we realize that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have provided us with unwavering care and guidance for which we need to feel grateful. This is something most people do not yet understand. When most people meet difficulties, they often blame others, even God. Rarely do they seriously think to reflect on their own faults. When we do not have deep feelings of remorse and regret, it is because of our delusions, our false views. Today, we often hear of people being cheated. Why do people cheat others? What is really happening here? If we understand Buddhism and the true reality of life and the universe, then we will understand that we are presently being cheated because we have cheated others in the past. Understanding this, and despite our being cheated, we will retain peace of mind if we look upon the repayment as a settlement of a debt. A debt of money must be repaid in cash and a life owed must be repaid in kind. This is principally sound and cannot be avoided. The Buddha told us that everything is a dream, an illusion, a shadow, a bubble. Nothing is permanent Nothing can be held on to. Nothing can be gained. This is the true principle. If we remember little else, we would do well to remember this. When we are truly able to understand that nothing can be gained and thus nothing can be lost, we will finally be free from delusion. Therefore, when we experience hardships, we need to think of them as a repayment of a debt. In this way, we will patiently, even gladly, give what others want and constantly give way to thoughts and feelings of remorse and regret. Today, we see many people with great good fortune, with immense wealth. Where does all this wealth come from? It does not happen by mere coincidence or good luck. Rather, it is accumulated from the cultivation of good deeds during our former lifetimes. It is from the giving of wealth. The manifestations of misfortune or good fortune do not occur by chance, but are due to respective causes created in our innumerable lifetimes. When the appropriate condition arises in the present lifetime, it allows the cause to come into effect and thereby produces the result. We can learn of the life of the Venerable Master Ying Guang in his journal. Master Ying Guang said that everything is attained through sincerity, 
which is benefiting oneself and from respect which is benefiting others with sincerity and respect we will be in harmony with others with sincerity and respect we will be able to help others in order to achieve a peaceful and harmonious society we need to understand the principles of cause condition and effect for others to respect us we need to respect others first to change our ways to change the environment for the better otherwise the great disasters of this world being the shared karma of all sentient beings will not be avoided thus throughout his entire life master inguang advocated the teachings of cause condition and effect with the aid of materials such as liao fan's four lessons he tirelessly advocated and wholeheartedly dedicated his life to helping all others regretfully there are many who wish for worldly fortune but there are few who are truly awakened and who seek birth into the pure land by his free distribution of books such as Liao Fan's four lessons and other books on cause and effect master inguang displayed a great heart of compassion and his devotion to helping humanity he was indeed a thus come bodhisattva a manifestation of great strength bodhisattva who appeared in this world to help we sentient beings although master inguang has passed on we can follow his example by introducing and extensively propagating the pure land method throughout the world with the aid of modern technology hopefully this can help to reduce to even eliminate the disasters with these proper thoughts and words perhaps we can overcome the improper words thoughts and actions of the past 2000 years for in this way our merits and virtues will be innumerable and immeasurable the buddha told us that we should not discriminate between other be people and between ourselves because we are all one we need to have compassionate thoughts do good deeds say kind words be a gentle person to be sincerely concerned for others to practice loving kindness we all live in the same world all have the same problems many of us need help when we have problems if someone is drowning and we can swim we do not ask what religion what race they are we do everything we can to help them if all of us gave help when it was needed our world would be gentle peaceful and happy and we would not have the problems that we do the hatred the wars the disasters 
we can either choose to create problems or to solve them. But if we do not help, we will never solve our problems. We can spend millions of U.S. dollars on making bombs, or we can spend 20 U.S. dollars a month to provide for a person in a third world country. We can spend money to kill or to save lives. Which one solves the problems? War will not solve problems. Giving unselfishly will. And true giving is totally without expectation of reward. If we expect something, then it does not solve the problem. When different cultures and religions respect and help one another, we will finally have a harmonious and prosperous society, a peaceful and stable world. This is what we hope for. This is our responsibility to create. When I was in Australia a few months ago with teacher, we attended the meetings of the Multi-Faith Forum, which is sponsored by the Australian government, and the World Conference on Religion and Peace. At these meetings, the leaders of different religious groups share their opinions and ideas on how to resolve the conflicts in our world. Their objectives are to establish a harmonious, to establish a prosperous, multicultural, multiracial, multireligious society. To have a stable and prosperous society and country, we first need to have harmonious interaction among cultural, racial, and religious groups. Every culture, every religion, every ethnic group possesses commendable qualities. And although we come from different backgrounds, we share many similarities. If we use these as a starting point to seek the common ground and lay aside our differences, we will be able to appreciate each other's good points. In this way, we will sincerely respect and no longer wish to interfere with the internal affairs of others or to solve problems by the use of force. In this way, conflicts will naturally dissolve. Wars will no longer be fought, and our society will be peaceful and prosperous. Buddha Shakyamuni explained that the universe, everything in it and we, are one complete entity. If we could all share this understanding, there would be no need to worry about the stability of the world. For using this as a starting point, we would understand that all others are ourselves. To harm others is to harm ourselves. To benefit others is to benefit ourselves. When we isolate ourselves from the whole with every thought only of ourselves, with every ensuing action for our own benefit, then it will be impossible to avoid confrontations 
and wars, among races, religions, and cultures. From the Buddha's teachings, we learn the importance of practicing and advocating compassion and equality. In our society, everybody plays a different role. But everybody's role is equally important and necessary. There is no good or bad, high or low. Just the difference between the assignment of tasks. At the beginning of the Flower Adornment Sutra, there are 175 groups attending the assembly who are of different species from different worlds throughout the universe. This is the quintessential multiculture, the gathering together of beings from different worlds with very different beliefs. In order to help us achieve this same harmony, all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas first explain that the universe is perfect, is one entity. The Chinese classic from 3,000 years ago, I Ching, the Book of Changes, explains how heaven and earth the four seasons and all phenomena were originally formed from infinite particles. Lao Tzu clarified further that the universe and we share the same root and that all creations and we are one entity. As Buddha Shakyamuni said, we all arose from the same essence. Let me tell you a story that someone reminded me of recently. We had both heard it from the Zen Buddhist master, Thich Nhat Hanh. It is about the Buddha and Mara, who is the embodiment of all that is bad, all that is evil. It was Mara that the Buddha defeated the night that he sat down under the Bodhi tree and vowed that he would not rise from until he attained enlightenment. One day, the Buddha was in his cave, and Ananda, who was attendant, was outside the cave standing near the door. Suddenly, Ananda saw Mara approaching. He was very surprised. He did not want this to happen, and frankly, he wished Mara would get lost. But Mara walked right up to Ananda and asked him to announce his visit to the Buddha. Ananda immediately questioned him. Why are you here? Don't you remember that a long time ago, the Buddha defeated you under a Bodhi tree? Aren't you ashamed to be here? Go away. The Buddha will not see you. You are evil. You are his enemy. When Mara heard Ananda say this, he began to laugh. Did you say your teacher told you that he has enemies? Ananda could say nothing else and had to go tell the Buddha of Mara's visit, hoping the Buddha would say, go tell him I'm not here. Tell him I'm in a meeting. But instead, the Buddha was very excited that Mara, an old friend, had come to visit him. Is it true? Is he really here, the Buddha said? And he went right up to Mara, bowed to him, took his hands in his in the warmest possible manner, the Buddha said, Hello, how are you? How have you been? But Mara said nothing. So the Buddha brought him into the cave 
prepared a seat for him and asked Ananda to go fix them some tea. Ananda went outside the cave but still listened to the conversation. The Buddha warmly repeated, How have you been? How are things going with you? Mara replied, Things are not going at all well. I am tired of being a Mara. I want to be something else. You know, being a Mara isn't easy. Every time you say something, you have to speak in riddles. Every time you do something, you have to look very evil and you have to be very tricky. Frankly, I'm really tired of it all. But what I especially can't bear is my followers. These days, all they talk about is injustice, peace, equality, liberation, and nonviolence. I've had enough of it. I think it would be better if I just turned them all over to you. I really want to be something else. The Buddha listened carefully and was filled with compassion. Finally he said, do you think it's fun being a Buddha? You don't know what my followers have done to me. They put words into my mouth that I never said. They build garish temples and put statues of me on the altars to attract bananas and oranges and rice and then they eat them themselves. And they package me and turn my teachings into a commercial endeavor. Mara, if you knew what it was like to be a Buddha, you would not want to be one. One of the things the Buddha and Mara were both sympathizing over was selfishness. Our selfishness has resulted in our harming others to benefit ourselves. This way of thinking has led to quarrels among people, feuds among families, wars among countries. It is the basic cause of human-made and natural disasters. If we observe this world carefully, we might well wonder what is the cause of these increasing disasters, our increasing selfishness. As the Buddha told us, all consequences come from our ignorance, our false beliefs, and wrong viewpoints. If we think of a tree as representing the universe and look at its leaves individually as ourselves, they appear to be separate, but in reality, they are part of the whole. Our thinking of ourselves as being separate creates barriers and confrontations if we were to look more carefully, we would see that the leaves originate from the same branch and that all branches grow from the same trunk. Looking deeply into the tree to its very roots, we realize that the leaves, branches, trunk, roots all arise from the same source. Once we truly understand this, all confrontations will vanish as our loving kindness and compassion naturally arise. As we care for others, as we care for ourselves, we can help to teach others to have no attachments, to be happy and at ease. 
Who can we help? Sentient beings in the whole universe. Too many? Then just teach sentient beings in our world. How? As students of the Buddha, we have the duty to propagate Buddhism properly, to guide all sentient beings. There are people with good roots who can easily accept the teachings, and there are others who lack good roots and thus are unable to accept the teachings, regardless of how eloquent we are and how hard we try to teach them. However, we need to give up judging others and to reflect upon ourselves and to see whether our way of introducing the Dharma is correct. Whether we have used convenient and skillful means of propagation. Whether we are really employing our wisdom and helping these beings by using ways that suit both their manner of living and level of understanding. The most significant problem that we have is that we do not have true sincerity. Our mind, our heart, is not sincere enough. If we have true sincerity, we can penetrate solid rock. If we have true sincerity, we will be able to touch people, and then we can help them to learn the Buddha's teachings. But we cannot, must not, try to t change a person's religious belief. When I was in Australia, I met a fellow practitioner who recently visited Singapore. He told teacher about being questioned as to how to convert Christians to Buddhists. Teacher and he agreed that this was wrong. Instead, we need to help Christians to be good Christians, Muslims to be good Muslims, Hindus to be good Hindus. How can we convert a Christian to Buddhism? How can we destroy a person's religious beliefs? How can we negate what their parents taught them. To do so is wrong. However, if we encourage these Christians, these Muslims, these Hindus to be bodhisattvas, to be beings who try to help all other beings, then we will be doing good. We do not help others by making them change their beliefs. Buddhism is a teaching of the wisdom that will help others to understand the true reality of life and the universe. When people do need to understand the truth, they do not need to change their religion to do so. We cannot ask them to give up their beliefs, to betray their parents, their God. Buddhism cannot break the laws of this world. If we convert people to Buddhism, we are destroying the law. Please understand that Buddhism is not a religion, it is an education. 
and we are students of the Buddha. We are not religious followers. In the Flower Adornment Sutra, we learn of a Brahmin who was a religious leader. In actuality, he was a bodhisattva who manifested as a religious leader. In so doing, he helped many sentient beings. If a bodhisattva wants to help Christians, he can appear as a Christian religious leader. If a bodhisattva wants to help Muslims, he can appear as a Muslim religious leader. In this way, bodhisattvas can help all beings to be good citizens. But if we are narrow-minded and we stubbornly say that your religion is not as good as mine, that mine is better, then we are totally wrong. For with this thinking, we will be unable to solve our problems. We will only create disharmony and conflicts. The Buddha taught four basic, basic principles in helping others. The first is to make others happy. Because if others are happy with us, then we will have good affinities with them. And we must have good affinities if we wish them to accept what we say. At the New Year's Eve charity dinner, we had well over 3,000 guests from different religions and different cultures. We were all together in one place for dinner, and yet the dishes that were served were different. While we had vegetarian meals, the Malays had different meals that were tailored to their tastes. We provided them with what they wanted and what they were used to. We did not expect them to eat like we do. To help others, to bring gentleness and peace to our world, we need to understand who people are, what their likes are, and what their dislikes are. Then we will know how to respect their customs and wishes. We must show care and compassion towards all. We should learn of other religions. Then we can explain Buddhism to them if and when they wish to learn of it. It is wrong for us to want them to give up their beliefs. We should care for others. Find out how to help them attain their goals, to meet their needs, to help them propagate their religions. Then they will be happy. Recently, when we visited the aged and children's homes of the Muslims and the Hindus, we gave them gifts of food and financial support. We did so because we were able to and because we are all one entity. We must be able to cooperate with each other because with good interaction, we will be able to establish and develop lasting relationships. To do this, we practice giving. One of the six paramitas practiced by bodhisattvas. Giving includes the giving of wealth, the giving of the Dharma, and the giving of fearlessness. 
the highest form of giving is that of the Dharma. One way to do this is to use kind speech. When we converse with others, we use words of loving kindness and compassion, for we truly care for them. We use speech that shows we care. We do not use empty, sweet words that just sound good. The next is that we work together with them. For example, our next planned event is a multicultural, multi-faith festival. It is a celebration of all cultures, all religions. It is a celebration of the flower adornment as seen in the flower adornment sutra. The flower adornment is a true practice of multiculture. It is the true world of truth, goodness, virtue, and beauty. The Western Pure Land and the flower store world live a multicultural festival every day. In Buddhism, when we learn something worthwhile, we must put it into practice. Thus, we must put the Dharma into practice. We must truly help sentient beings to become Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. There is unity in diversity and diversity in unity. Thus, in unity, we all share the common wisdom, common teachings. Unity does not adversely defect diversity, and diversity does not adversely affect unity. Rather, they are true beauty, happiness, and harmony. As ordinary people, we often make the mistake of trying to force others to be the same as us. But we must give up the thought to control others, give up thinking to possess others. Only in this way will we be able to enter the great festival of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. If we still have the thought to control others, we will always remain mired in the six realms of reincarnation, unable to enter the state of the Buddhas. Once we live among the Buddhas, we will be able to live harmoniously with all groups. We now see many conflicts, many wars around the world. Why do we hate? Why do we fight? Why do we kill? Different cultures, different religions. But how can we begin to even think that war can solve our problems? Buddha Shakyamuni renounced his life as a prince in a wealthy country and left home to become a monk. Why? He was heir to a kingship, but he knew he could not attain peace through politics. He was a warrior, but he knew he could not attain peace through warfare. He was a great leader, but he knew he could not attain peace 
through economics. He was a brilliant student, but he knew he could not attain peace through science. He knew that only through education could he attain peace, and thus he became a teacher. Only through education will we truly be able to solve our problems. Only by working together toward the same goals will we be able to attain peace and harmony. And if we are able to establish common thinking, we will then be able to eliminate the approaching disasters. If we can accomplish this, we will truly reach the non-duality between others and ourselves. Then we will understand that we are one being, all interrelated with one another. This is truly realizing that the universe is one entity, one ideal family. Thus, all disputes between ourselves and others will naturally dissolve as we experience great broad-mindedness. Those who have this great broad-mindedness are Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They have learned to give up trying to control others, have learned to give up selfishness and jealousy, to give up sentimental attachments, to give up blaming others for their own problems, to give up expectation of reward and thoughts of self, people, other beings, and time. They understand that every being, everything in the universe is subject to the law of cause and effect. They understand that every causal action produces an effect. Understand that we alone are responsible for everything that happens to us. Understand that everything is an illusion that nothing can be attained, that nothing can be gained, that nothing can be lost. The principles and methods of the Buddha's teachings are both logical and practical. These teachings are a treasure of humanity. The wisdom, the common thread that is the very essence, the very heart, the very root of our religious and secular cultures. This wisdom is the perfection of the universe, which can perfectly solve all our problems. We need to practice great goodness, great gentleness to care for all others as ourselves, to enter the awakened being's state of quiet joy, tranquility, serenity. By doing so, we will bring understanding, awakening, and true peace to our world, to all worlds, throughout the universe. Amitabha. Thank you.
Amen. Mm-hmm.